Happy New Year. Boy, I pray it's a great year for you. I pray that this year will be the best year ever for you. And if for whatever reason it turns out not to be the best year for you, then I'm going to pray that you have big shoulders so that you can bear the burden that God calls you to. This evening we're going to look at the puzzle of suffering from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 as we continue our study in Paul's little book called 2 Corinthians. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we commit this time to you. Lord, we know that we live in a wicked world where people do terrible things to one another. And Heavenly Father, we know that some people are facing trials and tribulations. Whether it's the loss of a job or the loss of a spouse or the loss of a dream. We know that sometimes in dark circumstances, people make choices that are not God-honoring and Christ-honoring. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that in dark circumstances, we could look to the light. In difficult circumstances, Lord, we could trust the one who has made a way for our salvation. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we would love you and that we would trust you with all of our hearts for all of our future. In Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. This is the first Wednesday of the first month of a new year. It's our custom at Calvary that this is the time when we have communion. And so, before our service ends, we're going to have communion. We have what's called an open communion. That means it's open to anyone who knows and loves and believes the Lord Jesus. And if for whatever reason that isn't a description of you, we're hoping before this Bible study ends, you will come to a place where you'll recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you'll invite him into your heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 8, Paul writes... For we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and, do, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. The epistle of 2 Corinthians is full of contrasts. There's these deep, divides between glory and humiliation, between life and death, between sorrow and consolation, between toughness and tenderness and dependence and despair. And Paul began the book and the chapter by reminding the people of Corinth that God is the source of comfort. And begins a look at the purpose of consolation and comfort. The more we suffer, the more comfort we can provide, the pattern of comfort and consolation. Paul's offering his own experience and example. And now Paul writes about his own trials in Asia. That's modern Turkey in verse 8. His testimony in the hour of death in verses 9 and 10 and 11 how Paul came to depend on the Lord for life itself in verse 9, and then how he was delivered by God, we're going to discover in verse 12. Paul speaks of what I call the math of mercy. 
As trials abound, comfort abounds. When sin abounds, grace abounds. By the way, Paul is going to use the word abound a lot in this letter. So why do we suffer? Well, Paul writes, in part, that we might comfort others in verses 1 through 7. In part, that we might have confidence in God alone in verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. And in part, that we might be able to claim the promises of God, which we will learn about in verses 12 through 24. So in verse 8, the Lord allows suffering to teach us daily dependence. Look at verse 8 again. For we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Paul writes about a difficulty. We know that the Lord will sometimes use difficulties, trials, suffering, to build and strengthen trust between God and the believer. For Paul, it was a desperate situation that would lead to what seemed like a death sentence. Now, one of the things that you need to be able to note from the text right from the start is that God allowed Paul to suffer. So I need to ask you kind of an obvious question. Does the New Testament seem to indicate that sometimes believers will suffer? The answer is obviously yes. Did Jesus suffer? Yes. Does Paul suffer? Yes. What happened in verses 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 to cause this kind of sorrow? We're not told. There's no record in the scripture. And I think for good reason. Some suggest that it was the mob violence that took place in Acts chapter 19, verse 23 through 41. For those who are unfamiliar with Acts chapter 19, it tells the story of what was going on in Paul's life. In verse 19 through 23, well, verse chapter 19, verse 23, it says about that time there was arose a great commotion about the way, that means the followers of Jesus. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Basically, Paul goes into Ephesus. He starts preaching the gospel. There is a riot and an uproar and death threats are made on Paul's life. We know that it caused such an uproar that he almost was killed. But he escaped. Some others suggest that it was a crushing disease. Some others suggest that it was some what looked to appear to be some sort of fatal illness. Some suggest that it was disheartening news from Corinth. But we're given some clues. Again, Paul talks about the trouble awaiting him in Asia in Acts chapter 20, verse 18, where it says, And when they came to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, remember, that's Turkey, not Asia in the sense of China, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears, with many trials, which happened by the plotting of the Jews. So there was an assassination attempt on his life. There was yet another attempt on his life. And when you live in constant fear that someone is trying to kill you, that can be a lot of pressure. Paul wrote, chains and tribulations await me in Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. Priscilla and Aquila, he writes, risked their lives for him. Paul expresses great victory experienced through terrifying trials in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, we read, 
For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made spectacles to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. He talks about being openly put to shame. Paul fought with beasts in Ephesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 32. Whether this is of the hairy kind or if this is of the scary kind, we're not told. The memories that Paul have are vivid in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. He has terrifying trials. Clement, who would later become the pastor at uh, Rome says that Paul was seven times incarcerated or in bonds. The point of the passage seems to be the weight, the measure, the intensity of the suffering. Paul was weighted down. He was overwhelmed beyond the ordinary natural powers of endurance. The value of the passage isn't in the exact nature of the suffering, but what God is going to provide. Each of you has your own story. You can talk about the time that your husband or your wife walked out on you. You can talk about the time that you suffered the loss of a job or a broken heart. Some wickedness took place where you thought that the only way out was to kill yourself. This last Saturday, I read of a woman in Texas. She was the wife of a pastor. She went to a gun store in East Texas. She purchased a handgun, went into the parking lot, and put the gun to her head and pulled the trigger. What has to happen in your life where it is so dark and so desperate that you feel like there's no way out. Philip's translation is helpful. He writes, at that time, we were completely overwhelmed. The burden was more than we could bear. In fact, we told ourselves, this is the end. That's what this passage is saying. Sometimes it's better to keep your feet on the ground than your head in the clouds, especially when you're at the end of your rope. And Paul talks about being burdened beyond measure, above strength, despairing even of life itself. Does that surprise you? That someone like Paul the Apostle could come to a place in his life where he thought there is no other option available to me other than than dying. Paul paints a picture almost like an animal that's hunted and weary till you come and you sink to the point of despair. You've reached the limits of your own personal strength. Suffering usually comes in two flavors, bearable and unbearable. H.L. Mencken jokes, how little it takes to make life unbearable, a pebble in the shoe, a cockroach in your spaghetti, a woman's laugh. It's very interesting to me. Because if you've ever experienced bearable suffering, You know you have people that you can turn to. You know you have resources available to you. But Paul is speaking of a different kind of suffering, a different kind of grief. In his book, God Forsaken, Dinesh D'Souza relates the story of a man named Nicholas Walterstorff. He's a theologian. And he writes of the loss of his 25-year-old son, Eric, in a mountain climbing accident. For a while after the burial, Walterstorff, Walter Storff writes, quote, the whole world becomes surreal. He writes, quote, I walked into a store. The ordinariness of what I saw repelled me. People putting onions into baskets, squeezing melons. Ordinariness of what I saw repelled me. Hoisting gallons of milk, clerks ringing up sails. How are you today? Have a good day. (laughs) 
how could everybody be going about their ordinary business when there was no longer ordinary times? I went to my office and along the way saw the secretaries at their desks and the students in their seats and the teachers at their podiums. Do you not know that he slipped and fell and that we sealed him in a box and covered it with dirt and he can't get out, unquote? Walter Storff and his family were surrounded by well-meaning Christians giving reassurances. What a full life he lived. Look at how he blessed your life and so on. He didn't find them consoling. The pain of what we lost, he says, outweighs our gratitude for what we once had. Don't say it's really not that bad, he urges would-be sympathizers, because it is. If you think your task as comforter is to tell me that really all things considered, it's not so bad. You don't sit with me in grief, but place yourself in the distance away from me. He's describing the kind of grief that's inconsolable. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever met someone like that? I'll never forget when I first saw Misty Bernal, Cassie Bernal's mom. It was just a few days after Columbine and after the death of her daughter. And she was doing a newscast. She did a press relief and she came out to talk about her daughter. And she said, I woke up this morning and the sun was shining, and the birds were singing. And I thought, how could they? When you have such a deep and profound loss, it doesn't seem like ordinary life should be the same. But then she talked about her faith and her confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everybody has that. Frederick Nietzsche famously said, if you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss will gaze back at you. Viktor Frankl said, despair is suffering without meaning. And the world is largely divided into those two camps. Does suffering really have meaning? Or doesn't it? The poet Henry David Thoreau conjectured, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And the sad tragedy is that it's true of Christians. That they live lives of quiet desperation. Not trusting God. Not trusting the promises. And so when Paul writes... Here, for we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia that we were burdened. I want to draw your attention to that word because it's going to be important as we continue our discussion. Because it's the Greek word bareo. It comes from the noun baros. The noun is await. So here in the verb form, it means bearing a burden that is so heavy that it seems impossible to bear. Paul is describing a crushing weight. Add to that beyond measure, kath, hyper, bolin. You know that word. We have a word that's come into our language from it, hyperbole. It's the word to exaggerate something in order to make a point. And so our own word hyperbole comes from that. Hyper means above or beyond. Balo literally means to throw something. And so uh, the idea is to throw so far beyond that you're incapable of finding it. In the New Testament, it's used metaphorically in the sense of either excellence or excess. Here, it means excess. And so the word despaired is the verb exa, poreo. It's only used here. And in chapter 4, verse 8, it's a strong compound word. Exa, poreo. It means to be utterly at a loss. The word means to be so utterly at a loss that you have no words to describe what you're feeling. There's no way to be able to, come to, to have resources in order to 
deal with whatever it is. So Paul feels that he's come to the end of his rope as far as life is concerned. And again, that might come as a, as a shock and a surprise to you, but it's a reoccurring theme in the Bible. Elijah was under a juniper tree at the point of personal suicide. The angel of the Lord instructed him and said, Arise and eat, and provided deliverance in 1 Kings 19. Paul was threatened with shipwreck and was told, Be of good cheer in Acts 27.5. When John was banished to the island of Patmos, that's when the Lord revealed himself in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. When Jonah found himself in the belly of the sea creature, the Lord gave him deliverance as soon as he was willing to pray, Salvation is of the Lord. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 9. When Joshua was on his face in utter defeat, the Lord God told him, Stand up. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 10. When Samson was grinding in the prison, Jehovah caused his hair to grow once again. When Israel was groaning in Egypt, Jehovah made him glad by bringing him out of it. And so there is this picture in the Bible of despair and deliverance. Of coming to the end of your rope. So that you could come to the beginning of an absolute dependence upon the Lord. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had a diagnosis of cancer? Where the doctor said, three months, six months. The kind of diagnosis that takes your breath away and you wonder how you're going to go forward. That's what Paul is talking about here. As a matter of fact, in verse 9, when it says, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Here, I think the sentence of death means, I think I'm going to die. My granny used to say, don't worry about getting older. When you stop getting older, you die. The literal meaning, apo, krima, the sentence of death, is literally in the Greek language an answer. In, in, in the Greek culture of law and justice, you would write a defense and you would write an answer. This is a legal term which would be used to describe a petition that's made for your death and this is how you answer the charges. Bushell, who's a very famous Greek scholar, said, it is a technical term of official and legal speech and denotes an official resolution or an inquiry or a petition to decide the matter. And so it came to mean in that culture a death sentence or a judgment of death. Bushell adds, quote, by human judgment, Paul could only reckon that his position was like that of a man condemned to death who had made petition for mercy and he received the answer, no mercy. Art and Gingrich agree with this and give it this definition. It means an official report, a specific decision. It's as if a legal judgment has been handed down. And once again, we're tempted to ask the question, why? Why, Paul? Why this choice servant? Why this faithful person? This isn't someone who is carnal. This isn't someone who's unbiblical. This isn't someone who's wasted his life. This is a person who said yes to Jesus. This is a person who's gone where Jesus told him to go. This is a person who did what Jesus told him to do. And he's suffering. And Paul's own response is that we should not trust ourselves. This is the reason why it's happening. Dependence. A radical dependence upon the Lord. Now I want you to think about that. Paul likens his own suffering as an opportunity to depend fully, wholly, completely, specifically upon the Lord. And that's what happens when you come to the end of your resources. And look what Paul says. He gives a title to the Lord. 
the Lord God who raises the dead. And here's the point. Paul, you're going to die. And Paul says, then I'm going to have to trust the God who raises people from the dead. What a powerful statement. I'm going to have to trust the one who raises the dead. Look, Paul, here's what your options seem to be. Really hard death or excruciating death. Well, I guess death it is. You see, the death of Jesus speaks of the love of God, but the resurrection of Jesus speaks of the power of God. The Bible speaks of the fact that in death and resurrection, God is satisfied with Jesus. Jesus rises from the dead and is glorified. When Jesus rose from the dead, our sins are gone. And now you understand what Paul means when he writes, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees that we're given the Spirit of God, and so we can't save ourselves. And sometimes, sometimes we live in a world where it looks like death is going to take its toll. In order to be saved, we have to trust God. Suffering reminds us of our insufficiency and God's sufficiency. And so what is our only hope when the sentence is death? Paul writes, I'm going to trust the person who raises us from the dead. You see, the Lord will sometimes allow suffering to teach us to trust him. Again, in his recent book, God Forsaken, Dinesh D'Souza speaks of several people who came to reject God at a point of suffering and despair. Owen Flanagan rejected Christianity because he said, quote, I came not to like or respect the God I was taught to believe in. I still don't like or respect the image of that God, unquote. Thomas Nagel writes in the last word, quote, I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God, it's that I hope there's no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that, unquote. Why is that? Why do we live in a world that hopes there's no God? I think you know the answer if you look deep into your heart. It's because the truth is that they're sinners. And they don't want to be held accountable for their actions and their wickedness. With a God comes the reasonable expectation that you might have to give an account to that God. D'Souza also quotes the famous physicist Victor Stenger, quote, if he does exist, I personally want nothing to do with him, unquote. D'Souza writes, quote, Christopher Hitchens said in several of our debates that assuming there was a heaven, he had no interest in going there. God, he said, is a celestial dictator like the now deceased North Korean despot Kim Jong-il, only worse. Quote, if you are living under Kim Jong-il, Hitchens said, then at least at some point you die and the tyranny is over. But with God, it goes on forever. I can't imagine a more terrifying place than heaven. For me, that would be hell, unquote. What? There are people who live like that? In the darkness? In the wickedness? In the emptiness? And so Paul writes, the Lord allows suffering to depend upon him and to teach us trust. Look at verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. The Lord allows suffering to promote dependence, but now he writes not only to promote dependence, but to provide deliverance. What? Because sometimes God will deliver the past look at what it says who delivered us from so great a death the past and does deliver the present and the future 
He will still deliver us. In that single, single sentence, you have the past, the present, and the future. Except for, again, when you look at the original language. This is one of those situations where it becomes more difficult when you actually know the original language. Paul speaks of deliverance once in the past tense. Even though it looks like in our translation, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, it looks like the present tense, but really it's the future tense twice. What does that mean? Well, the overall point is unmistakable and clear. The Lord delivered Paul out of some situation where it meant certain death. If the riot in Ephesus is the historical context, then Paul is referring to the sudden stop and miraculous escape that takes place in Acts chapter 20, verse 1. The same God who miraculously delivered Paul in the past is well able to deliver him in the future and will deliver him in the final moment when we're completely released from the sufferings and the trials and the tribulations and the persecutions of this world. And that's part of the point that Paul is making in the passage. Jesus has helped me in the past, he's writing. Delivered me. Miraculously. Incredibly. And he will in the future. By the way, most of you know the story of how Paul will eventually die. He will make his way to Spain. He'll return back to Rome. He'll find himself in a Roman prison where he will be adjudicated, found guilty, and be sentenced to death. And because he's a Roman citizen, he will be spared the gruesome death of crucifixion but he'll be beheaded. But the truth, he will face unmistakably a martyr's death. The same God who delivered Paul in the past is able to deliver in the future. And there will come a mo moment in each and every one of our lives where we will be released from suffering and released from trial and released from tribulation and released from persecution. A recent study has indicated that Christianity runs the risk of becoming extinct in the place where it was born, in Israel, in Syria. Do you realize that if you are a Christian, Almost certainly, you will be persecuted if you live anywhere in the Middle East. But the Bible makes it abundantly clear that the strategy of suffering and persecution, Satan's strategy, doesn't work. Because with the pressure and with the trial and with the persecution, Christians become more emboldened to love him and believe him and serve him. And so the Lord allows suffering to teach daily prayer and thanksgiving. Look what it says in verse 11. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. How are we to think about that? Suffering to promote dependence. Suffering to provide deliverance. Suffering now so that we'll pray in a directed way, in a focused way, in view towards gratitude. Look what Paul is saying. Look at that interesting expression in verse 11. You also helping together in prayer for us. Paul is fond of the Greek prefix, syn, S-Y-N. Like we get the word, it's a connective. As a matter of fact, it means in the Greek language, togetherness. We have a word in our own language, synthesis. It's when you take two things and you bring them together. This is exactly part of the point that he's making here. Paul joins the prefix with the root porgeo, only here in the New Testament. It means 
to join us together by helping us. That's what the, the meaning of the word is. And so here, and it's so only here in the Greek New Testament, it means to join in helping us. What is he saying? You also helping together. Look what it says. Read it yourself. In prayer. Paul simply assumes that the Corinthians were doing their duty and praying for him during the trial and during the difficulty. One of my favorite definitions of prayer is Wiersbe's. He writes, quote, prayer is the means God has ordained. Prayer is the means that God has ordained to glorify himself by sharing his love with his children, meeting their needs, accomplishing his purposes through their lives and the lives of others. I like that. We know from the tone and the content of the letter of 2 Corinthians that some people questioned Paul's apostolic calling. Others might have secretly delighted that Paul was in pain. However, Paul gives them the benefit of the doubt. In other words, he believes that no matter what else the Corinthians may or may not have against him, that as Christians, they're praying for him. Arguments rarely settle things, but prayer changes things. The Bible teaches that the believer's prayer helps. If trouble drives you to prayer, then prayer will drive the trouble away. And so here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, my troubles, my despair, my problems provided an excellent opportunity for you to pray and then for your prayers to be answered. Sometimes even preachers face serious depression. Charles Haddon Spurgeon would go through severe doubts, dark times, desperate times. And during one severe depression, one of the officers of the church asked, those who have been converted or blessed under the ministry, please stand to your feet. And 1,200 people stood to their feet. Now, said the deacon, I charge you all, pray for your pastor. I love that. Because you see, it's the pastor's job to pray for you. But it's also your job to pray for the pastor. It's your husband's duty to pray for his wife and the wife's duty to pray for her husband. But the Bible makes it abundantly clear that we share a common burden and joy. Praying. Prayer causes God to move on our behalf to deliver us through our suffering. And when we're strengthened and delivered, everyone gets to praise God. And so that's part of the point that Paul is making, intercessory prayer. And remember what intercessory prayer is. Intercession is asking God for what others need. And so Paul simply assumes that this is exactly what's happening in the deep difficulty. He understood that people would be praying for him. If you're a stranger to prayer, then you're probably a stranger to power. And prayer, my granny used to say, is hardest when it's hardest to pray. When should you pray? when you most feel like not praying. And that's exactly right. You know, we have a prayer chain at the church. And it's not just there for times of desperation. It's there for inspiration, mutual support, an opportunity for us to minister to one another. The psalmist in Psalm 50 verse 15 said, Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. And you shall glorify me. In Job chapter 42 verse 10, it says, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends 
Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Over and over again, we're told to pray when we suffer and to pray when others suffer. By the way, the Bible is full of examples of noble intercessors who prayed for the blessing of others. Moses, who was himself willing to be blotted out of the Lord's book so long as Israel might be spared in Exodus chapter 32. You remember the story in chapter 32, verses 1 through 14, where God is getting ready to wipe out the Jewish people. And Moses begins to pray, and he begins to intercede for them. Samuel, the faithful prophet, pleaded for Israel and Saul when they had fallen deep into sin, deep into rebellion and disobedience in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Daniel, the humble statesman and prophet, pleads for the nation of Judah while they're in captivity, all the while identifying himself with his people and their sin. Epaphras in the New Testament, the loving pleader, interceding for the people, the saints at Colossae, that they might be perfect and complete in the will of God. If you look at uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, Epaphras who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect. That means complete. In the will of God, it becomes a picture of intercessory prayer and priestly service as he's bringing the believers before the throne of God. And then, of course, Paul himself, the intense suppliant, pleading for the church at Ephesus that they might understand, embrace, experience God's unparalleled riches in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 through 20. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. If you ever want to do an exciting personal Bible study, look at the epistles of Paul. Read the opening chapter and his prayers for the Ephesians, for the Philippians, for the Colossians. John, the loving disciple who prays for his friend Gaius that he might prosper in 3 John chapter 2. Jesus, of course, in John chapter 17, who prays for all of us. And particularly in Luke chapter 22, where he prays for Peter that his faith won't fail. Robert Murray McShane said, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies, yet distance does not make no difference. He's praying for me. Can you imagine? You imagine Jesus praying for you. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift. I want to draw your attention to that word gift in verse 11 very quickly. It's the Greek word charisma. It's translated gift 15 times in the New Testament. A free gift twice. Six times in Romans chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians, it's related to that word charis, grace. So it can mean a gift, but it usually means a gift freely given or graciously given. A favor that's been bestowed. So it came to mean a favor or a gracious favor or the favor of being delivered. And what do you suppose the gift is in verse 11? given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through the many. What do you suppose the gift is? I'm going to suggest to you that beginning in verse 8, 9, 10, and ending here with verse 11, it's the gift of being delivered from the certainty of death. In other words, here's what he's saying. I was going to die. And you prayed for me. And God spared my life. 
That seems to be the point. Paul leaves the Corinthians with the idea that his escape from death is in part the direct result of the intercession of the saints. Many prayed. Here's the idea. Many prayed, so many had their prayers answered. That might come as a shock and a surprise to you. That sometimes we suffer. Simply so the saints will pray and grow and trust and depend. No wonder John Bunyan said prayer is a shield to the soul and a delight to God and a scourge to Satan. Someone has well said, when we depend on man, we get what man can do. But when we pray, we get what God can do. And you see, sometimes that's exactly where we're at. We face a circumstance where there's no way out. We sometimes think that prayer is the last thing that we can do in an, in an impossible circumstance. But somehow we have to come to learn that it's the first thing that we do in every circumstance. And so the desperate situation that Paul faced and the death sentence would lead to a kind of divine comfort, God's protecting hand, God's divine deliverance. Paul's close brush with death encouraged him more than ever to depend on God and trust God. And then also to trust the saints. You see, the Christian can't escape trouble. But through Christ, we can be victorious in trouble. And that becomes one of the key things of understanding this passage. Trouble's on its way, but we'll trust Jesus. You know, trouble can sometimes be a form of discipline bringing us to a place of dependence so that we'll experience deliverance so that we'll learn to pray. The age-old problem of evil and suffering can be hated and debated, but Paul doesn't enter into a philosophical discussion of suffering. What Paul does is he speaks of a personal experience of dependence, of trust, and answers to prayer you know, death has been called the king of terrors. But if we can be delivered from the fear of death, we can begin to embrace and have unshakable confidence in the Lord of life. And that becomes also, remember, part of Paul's point. The Christian life cannot be lived in isolation. And so Paul will soon tell his family in Corinth that even though his faith has been severely tested, God's grace is sufficient for such things. That's what it says in verse 12. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity. But that's again for next week. The final word, faith, real faith, will be tested. Real faith becomes an invitation for God's grace. And God's grace is sufficient. So, Paul adds to his argument. We depend upon God. We experience deliverance. We experience comfort. We experience the answer to prayer. And that is just the first 11 verses. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, knowing that there are people in trouble. And Heavenly Father, we know that sometimes we're reluctant. We don't want to tell people about our difficult circumstance. 
we don't want to tell people about our deep depression. We don't want to tell people about our brush with death. We don't want to tell people about the dark and empty place that we sometimes find ourselves in. And Heavenly Father, we know that if how we pray and the circumstances that we pray and the length that we pray is any indication that there's something desperately wrong with us. And yet, Lord, over and over again, you invite us to depend upon you, to trust you, to cry out to you. And Lord, even if we face the possibility of death, that in the end, you're going to affect deliverance. Because the same God who raised Jesus from the dead will in fact raise us from the dead. And John's gospel we know because Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life, and he that believes in me, even if he were dead, yet shall he live. That even death itself isn't the end, but rather a glorious beginning to eternal fellowship and eternal love. And so, Heavenly Father, again, we pray that we would come to grow up and mature and that we would understand and allow suffering to mold us, shape us, mature us, and grow us. In Jesus' name.